All right. Um, welcome. Uh, good afternoon. I think uh, welcome to this uh, exciting panel. And uh, I'm going to do, uh, my name is Mike Yao. I'm the moderator for this panel. I'm a professor of digital media and informatics at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. Um, and I am an interdisciplinary researcher that studied, have this studied uh, the interactions between technology and human, in particular, the communicative processes and the dynamics uh, in this. And the recent development of AI just prompted many, many very exciting questions, um, such as how human-like uh, features of AI and how the mimicry of dialogue and conversations affect human performance, human thinking, and human behavior. And as AI acts more social, um, more like humans, um, we have to start in thinking about some of the social dynamics. But in the context of today's conversation, very excited to introduce a panel of students um, to share their views on how AI uh, can impact their learning, education, and their views uh, about this technology and, and, and the you know, various thoughts that they have. So I'm very, very excited to sit back and listen to your presentations. And um, we will have a couple of minutes at the end of your presentations for Q&A. And so I encourage everyone to type your questions in the Q&A chat and we'll try, our speakers will try to answer them as um, much as they can. And then at the end, I will wrap it up and with some of my own questions, if time permits, um, on it to, to provide a summary. So let's get started uh, with an introduction of our speakers. So I will go one by one. Maybe um, I think the, this will help us to um, um, move things around. So our first speaker is uh, Jan. Um, I'm just going with the order of the, in the handbook. Jan Bartvis is a rising junior in uh, Minerva University, Minerva University selected by WRI as the most innovative university in the world. Jan is also the founder and CEO of Ecoverse, a youth-led NGO that supports Pol uh, Polish high school students in developing entrepreneurship skills and network through startup crash courses, workshops, and ideations. Uh, Ecommerce gamered uh, the support of Lego, Baker McKinsey, and Google, with Young recognized as a Transcend Network Fellow and a finalist of the Emerging Europe Award supported by the European Commission. So this past year, Young has also spoken at AIM conferences and at uh, Abu Dhabi, European Financial Con uh, Congress in uh, SOPAP and Global Youth Trend in Forum in Taipei. So very impressive record. And um, uh, let's start with you, Yang. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. And I would like to start off my presentation with a quote. Teaching is a walk in a park if that park is a Jurassic Park. We as students know that teaching is hard and appreciate all the hard work teachers are doing, especially in the AI era. So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Jan Bartkowiak and today I will talk about AI in business education. Although I think that a lot of ideas I'll discuss can be applied into other fields and domains as well. So before I move to the presentation, uh, a short introduction about myself. I'm a junior at Minerva University, where I've co-founded AI Consensus, a student-led movement aiming to illustrate how AI can amplify learning for both students and educators, and also the founder of eConverse, where we help teens develop future-ready skills and enter the world of startups, hence the business education component. Uh, so right now, business students seem to have a lot of fire, the spark that is needed to succeed in business, inside of them, but not so much besides it. If you think about it, they're kind of like Charmander, one of the famous Pokemon starters that requires a lot of training in order to evolve to its most powerful version. Why is that the case? Well, business education seems to have three fundamental problems. First of all, it's overly theoretical. There's a gap between what we learn in case studies and use in the real world, especially when launching our own enterprises. Business education should focus on tangible, career applicable skills rather than abstract theorems. Secondly, the current system is predominantly passive. Although we learn more effectively by doing and experimenting, as it, for example, makes us experience more emotions or allow us to build upon associations, 
Active learning is mostly absent from business education. I believe this needs to change. Lastly, business education is detached from market needs, especially in the age of AI. Flexibility, teamwork, synthesis, and tool navigation are becoming ever so important. This is why we, first and foremost, need to provide business students with these competencies rather than a lot of content based on rough memorization from case studies. So now, before we dig into the examples of use cases, let's outline the broader categories where AI can support business education. And what I mean by education is developing meta competencies that cannot be automated by AI, but which the AI tools can help amplify and make more productive. Firstly, AI can amplify our research efforts, whether through summarizing materials, analyzing trends, or mining data from different sources. Secondly, it can support us in ideation and even getting feedback from others. The latter can be achieved through visualizations uh, that are sometimes easier to, to respond to than Google Docs master plans, whereas the prior can be achieved by asking even the most fundamental questions to AI tools or asking it to provide tailored feedback. For example, act like Adam Newman to criticize one's pitch deck transcript. Thirdly, AI can support in crafting business plans. It can create prototypes, analyze different growth scenarios, market size, and develop financial projections for you. Lastly, AI offers a huge support in pitching and public speaking, which I believe to be a crucial element of an AI resilient business education and a skill that will allow us to shine in the new era. AI can help us understand the audience and the context of our speeches better. It can help us write our first drafts orally, whether we're on a walk, meeting, or wherever. And it can also provide personalized feedback to our speeches. All in all, AI offers an accessible and at last a personalized business ex education experience. A lot more practical and interactive for everyone involved. Now I'm going to show you how students can use AI for some of the aforementioned use cases. Let's begin. Our first example is market sizing. Here I'm asking ChatGPT to size the electric vehicle market in 2040 India. I lay out two main variables, the amount of Indians who will be able to afford the cars and the percentage of Indians that will prefer to buy these cars and ask ChatGPT to come up with the assumptions while providing examples of what these assumptions could entail. I ask ChatGPT to mention specific market projections and point out the goal of the explanatory challenge to examine the magnitude of the opportunity for Tesla that, uh, as some of you may know, has long considered entering the Indian market. As we see, uh, ChatGPT first gives us the assumptions uh, it's working upon, like India's population or how big India's middle class will be in 2040. And as I agree with all of the assumptions given by ChatGPT, we proceed. Then uh, ChatGPT shows a specific walkthrough and describes each step in its working. Again, as its calculations are correct, we proceed and see that Tesla's potential market size in 2040 would be around 75 million customers. If we were to disagree with any of the steps or thought that ChatGPT made a mistake, we could obviously challenge it and then adjust the result of ChatGPT. But uh, now we also have uh, solid logic to prove our reasoning. And most importantly, it only took us two minutes to complete work that would normally take us at least 30 minutes. Thank you, ChatGPT. Our second example is public speaking that I have earlier mentioned as a crucial yet often overlooked competency in business education. I use speaker.ai mostly because I can use it anywhere, anytime, anyhow. Based on my goals, as well as confidence level, Speaker assigns exercises and tutorials that guide me to become a better public speaker. As you can see on the right part of the screen, Speaker also provides instant and actionable feedback on the speeches. Not only does it evaluate the pace uh, intonation and sentiment, but it also creates note cards and transcripts of speeches, which you can easily use to further refine your speech and do it a lot more effectively. Here you can also see a lot of other tools for the use cases I've mentioned. 
a short list of them can be found can be found here but feel free to reach out to me if you're looking for additional tools or have another task you potentially want to automate with ai so after hearing all of that and seeing the revolutionary potential of ai in the business classroom you might be asking how do i implement ai well don't worry here it comes Firstly, make sure to establish a clear set of standards and principles for the use of AI. What use cases can the students bring to the table? What should they not do with AI? These are all important topics to address. With that said, constantly reevaluate your syllabus, methodology, and coursework. AI is changing at a rapid pace, and it is most likely impossible to preemptively design a system that will function well in one or two years. And the best way to constantly improve is to receive feedback from your students. Engage with them and try to implement their feedback. Their voice really matters and they often know what's best for them. One additional measure I would suggest is creating an AI library for all students to contribute and experiment with. You could moderate that master sheet as a professor and have students list their favorite prompts ways in which they use AI, and even the concerns and fears they have when it comes to using AI in the classroom. You can also have students upvote their favorite use cases, see which are the most popular amongst the class, and then design your curriculum based on that. Doesn't it sound great? Do all of that, and I guarantee that you'll amplify the experience for both yourself and your students. You will have more time, satisfaction, and be able to engage in more meaningful interactions. So to summarize, AI can elevate the creative potential of both the educators and the students. With the support of arguably the most powerful machine we have ever created, we can become centaurs or charizards and change world for the better. At the same time, we need to prepare for a lot to change and change quickly. AI is growing exponentially and you sure know how that curve looks like. So embrace AI, work hard on adapting, and I guarantee you that you'll benefit. If you like the presentation, I would like to invite you for the AI Diathon happening on August 11 in Mindspace, San Francisco, where we'll brainstorm AI policies for the upcoming semester and share the ways in which we use AI in the classroom. Feel free to sign up using the QR code below. Thank you so much for your attention. It was a pleasure to speak to such a distinguished audience. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jan. Very insightful um, presentation. And um, so if, you, if you're in case just wondering, uh, there are some of the answers, uh, the panelists are directly answer, providing the answer in the chat. So you post the question and it just kind of check the answers uh, in the chat, chat window. And, and, uh, and if you need further clarification, just have a dialogue there. Our second speaker is a China Yu, a learning design and technology master student at Stanford University, has been exploring the potential of AI in education. So recently he spoke at the Johns Hopkins Delta Symposium panel about AI's impact on the future of education and is currently an applied scientist, a science research uh, intern at Microsoft in AI. And he also developed his own AI digital twin. I actually played it a little bit this morning. And uh, China, uh, China, uh, China AI, uh, which offers an experiential uh, perspective on AI use in personal as well, uh, as well as educational environments. So let's welcome China Yu. Hi, thank you so much for that great introduction. Um, my name is China and I, um, I'm from Hong Kong and I just graduated from Johns Hopkins University and as an incoming uh, learning design and technology master's student at Stanford, I've been exploring really the potential of AI in education. I remember the day after class when I shared and created an AI simulation of my professor using ChatGPT in front of her. I described my professor's roles, responsibilities as an educator to ChatGPT, and then instructed it to think as if it was my professor and to respond from her perspective. With the AI professor that I created, I had a quick conversation about the topic I was learning and then how I should best ask for an extension for an upcoming assignment. I watched as my professor's jaws dropped. The reality is, is that we've come a long way since. 
The class that I was taking was in data analysis. And the techniques that I've learned to perform analysis using Excel and Tabulo in five hours can now be done in two minutes with the help of ChatGPT's code interpreter, where I'm able to upload a CSV file and just tell it to create a data visualization for me instantly. Currently, as a research intern at Microsoft, I'm getting front row tickets in observing at my workplace how AI will continue to change and shape our future and why it is especially important for us to prepare for these new technologies. Now, I can only imagine how you are feeling. Perhaps excited, a bit scared, or frightened. The reality is that while generative AI can provide you with a lot of facts and information, it is only through our curation and interpretation of that information do we translate its output as knowledge and wisdom. It is only through our interpretation of AI output that we are able to translate it into our knowledge and wisdom. The question that we should then ask instead to prepare students is how do we prepare them for this new age? And one of the key features actually that are often overlooked by educators is that you can export chat logs from ChatGPT. And thereby, if you're able to empower students to use this tool, you can monitor their chat logs to see the quality of the conversation and ensure that they're still having that same kind of critical thinking level. Another thing that you can explore is to explore beyond just the traditional vanilla chat GPT. As I mentioned earlier, I played around with the code interpreter, which you can see right here in this quick little demo. As you can see, I am selecting the code interpreter option and I'm able to upload a CSV file or a data file and ask ChatGPT to create different kinds of visualizations for me. In this example right here, it's able to take in the data that I shared and then create a simulation and visualizations that include a histogram, a scatter plot, and many additional ones. And what's exciting about this is that it goes way beyond just the traditional conversation interface, which what a lot of people think about when they think about ChatGPT these days. As you can see right here, this is the uh, visualizations that the ChatGPT accompanying with Code Interpreter is able to create based on the data that I provided with, that I've uploaded to their platform. You see, deliberate integration with ChatGPT into the assignments is important. And I, I haven't finished my story, right? The story that I started off with where my teacher was shaken by my demo, she actually came back two weeks later to talk about it, humbly acknowledging and recognizing the significance of the technology and how students may be able to offer unique insights. Together, we were able to brainstorm meaningful ways to explore how can we actually incorporate AI further into the classroom, leading to one of my class projects being creating a chatbot uh, about um, my class material. And this is also another example of that, where you can talk with me a bit more in that China AI. And so as we continue to think about this, I think that as an educator, the most productive thing that you can do right now is to have a meaningful conversation with your students about AI and the future that it should play in not only education, but the workplace and our life and beyond. One specific question that you can use as a launch pad is, what would the future be like in five years with AI? What would an average day actually look like? And not specifically about what can we do more or do better, but what would actually be meaningfully different? Thank you so much. And I'd love to take any questions. China, China uh, thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. And I uh, think your advice of not just thinking about as educational tool, and it opened up a dialogue is really resonating and uh, um, love to follow up and maybe offline on that as well to learn from your perspective. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is Sophia Tim. 
a senior at Lake Forest College, is currently working towards her bachelor's of science in neuroscience and a bachelor of arts in philosophy. She's driven by her desire to connect science with the complex uh, complexities of the mind uh, and with a deep rooted passion in healthcare. So Sophia looks forward to beginning uh, her study uh, after finishing college uh, at, uh, and then utilizing her medical expertise uh, and empathy to fulfill her lifelong purpose of serving others. This is a wonderful opportunity. So um, without further ado, Sophia, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. So sorry, give me just a second to get this set up. Here we go. All right, well, thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, yes, as he said, my name is Sophia and I'm humbled to be able to share a few thoughts with you all today coming from just my perspective as a current college student. Uh, so yeah, as these new technologies are emerging, there seem to be endless conversations that we can dive into with endless different topics. Uh, today though, I'd love to use this chance to share a little bit about the conversation that surrounds generative AI and how we can leverage it to foster equity. I go to a liberal arts college and I will be beginning, be beginning PA school next fall. Um, I still have a diverse group of friends though, including business, sociology, music majors, and more. Uh, something that often strikes my friends and I is just the stark reality of inequity in today's world. And it's a conversation that I think is really ongoing at many college campuses. Whether we are business or pre-med majors, it's a problem that we can't really ignore. And even further than that, it's something that many of us are committed to actively resolving. Today, I would love to use this space to specifically look at how can we potentially leverage generative AI tools to promote equity in collegiate settings. So I'd love to share some of the terms that I will be referencing today just to ensure that everybody's familiar with them. So generative AI is a type of technology that can produce different content when it's prompted by a user. And ChatGPT is a type of generative AI that responds to questions or prompts when it's asked. Um, you can see above, I've uh, kind of given an example of what a chat GPT output looks like. I'm sure this is familiar to many of us, but in the white is the prompt that I gave it, and in the gray is the output that it produced for me. I also think it might be helpful to first orient ourselves in the areas where we see current inequities today. So in primary education, we see that non-white preschool kids are more likely to be suspended than their white peers. When we move into the high school setting, there's a discrepancy in the kinds of advanced classes that students from underserved communities are even able to take. Moving globally, 37% of people in the world have never even used the internet. And of this 37%, 96% of them live in developing countries. And there isn't simply one reason for why inequities exist. There are many things like school funding, teacher quality, and many, many more factors that perpetually contribute to systemic inequalities. We can't simply name this on one issue. And we know that these inequities pre-college translate pretty directly into collegiate settings. Over one third of college students are food or housing insecure. And we also see that students from underserved backgrounds lack access to networking significantly more than their affluent peers do in college. The same systemic issues that arise pre-college are also persistent at the collegiate level. Educational inequities are tied to a lack of access of resources, of funds, and these are perpetuated at every level of the education spectrum. So I'm sure you're wondering where does AI fit into all of this? And I would like to propose a model just for the possible outcomes concerning equity when we face a new technology. First, I think it's possible that we create new inequities because of the way that we address a new technology. New technology is intertwined with internet access and that alone means that there's potential for us to exacerbate existing inequities. Consider a scenario where only some students learn how to use something like ChatGPT. They use it to enhance their work, to leverage it for their learning. But meanwhile, students who don't learn how to use it are left behind. The discrepancy doesn't only widen education inequity, but it also amplifies existing educational disparities. The in-education becomes another factor that aids in digital illiteracy. And then we could consider a second outcome where no new inequities emerge, but existing inequities remain unchanged. However, we have to know that we have to actively prevent new inequities from emerging here, and this has to be an active process. 
Um, this is much harder to do in practice than I think it sounds, um, but unlike in the scenario above, maybe we do this successfully. We give all students the information that they need and no new inequities emerge. But then let's look at outcome number three. We actively avoid new inequities from emerging. We are cognizant that this is rapidly evolving technology and that large challenges arise. But, and this is where I think we can start to get kind of excited, we can leverage AI to mend some of the existing inequities in education today. At the college setting, with a bit of, I think, creativity and persistence, we can create new resolutions to these persistent problems that we see. We can use ChatGPT as a catalyst for change. And for the remainder of this time today, I'd love to go over a few of the ways that I think that we can use it to mend existing inequities. Now, the first way that I think that we can leverage generative AI is by expanding access to course specific skills. We know that not all students enter college with the same language comprehension with the same writing mechanics including international students, including students from underserved backgrounds. ChatGPT expands access to these class specific skills to allow students to quickly progress in any time of day with individualized and specific questions. However, this absolutely comes with a caveat. Students need to be educated on these tools to bridge the gap between use of the tool and the inability to effectively utilize it. The second way that I think that we can do this is through um, interactive feedback. Accessibility is a key driver of inequity, and we can remedy some accessibility, inaccessibility with AI. Students from underserved backgrounds often lack the resources for paid tutoring. And furthermore, as I mentioned earlier, compared to affluent peers, students typically have less interaction with their professors. While it is true that many universities offer free resources like department tutors, we have to consider the broader context in which students live in as dynamic people. Yes, you can argue that they still have access to free resources, but we can't forget about the multifaceted barriers that still impede their use of these resources. Consider a student who has to work two jobs during school or imagine a student who commutes to save on rent. Maybe the tutoring hours are inaccessible. You could argue they could just use something like Zoom, but what if they don't have internet access at home? In these scenarios, there's a deceptive availability of resources as accessibility remains an issue. So we, we can teach students how to use ChatGPT as a tutor to provide personalized feedback for a variety of assignments. Everyone agrees it takes hard work to be able to succeed in college, and AI functions as a tool to allow students to do the hard work. This only works when they're given the tools to use it correctly though. So as I mentioned earlier, students who come from underserved backgrounds often have less mentorship during their college experience. And this includes postgraduate mentoring. Arguably, the, this uh, group of students who need strong mentorship the most are the students from backgrounds where they aren't necessarily familiar with the postgraduate process. ChatGPT can function to advise students in their postgraduate plans, and it's aware of the nuances that come with each field. And I would like to comment here that an understanding of ChatGPT is really critical for students entering the working world after college. Workplaces are requiring proficiency in these skills and expect their new graduates to be competent in using them. Even more, workplaces want new graduates to be the ones teaching others who graduated before these tools existed. Coming back to the first point that I made, we can create new inequities if we approach new technology inappropriately. And if some students don't learn how to be proficient, I think that we're only creating larger problems. And here I'd like to share a tool that we learned about earlier, which is Conmigo. And it's an example of a way that we can leverage AI to help increase high quality access to education for students who don't have the resources to hire a tutor or for students who find themselves needing homework help New tools rooted in AI can promise to resolve barriers to education. So I think considering everything that we've discussed so far, we see that educational inequities persist at all levels of teaching. We've explored how generative AI could potentially mend um, existing inequities in collegiate education. And now I know that many of you are thinking about the places where we need to identify inequities that AI creates. That's a conversation that I invite all of us to be having and to readily explore. We have brainstorming sessions today. I know there are many platforms that we can discuss these questions on and I invite us to continue having those conversations. 
what about the students who don't have access to internet at home? We do need to find a way to also get them these tools. We also need to continue to find ways where we can bridge the inequities that something like this creates. And I would love to leave us all with one more thought to ponder. Each of us in some way has committed ourselves to a pursuit of lifelong learning. We say that we're lifelong learners, that we're committed to that goal. Now we stand at the threshold of a new technology. This could absolutely be unsettling to face, but I think it's in these moments that we as students, as educators can transform our commitment to lifelong learning into a palpable action. This is what that looks like in play. It doesn't mean that we blindly accept these tools. Instead, I think it signifies our readiness to look deeper, to ask incisive questions, to have challenging conversations, just like the one that we're having right now. So I think we should continue to be the lifelong learners that we aspire to be and that we say that we are. We should step into the future with open minds and with thoughtful inquiry. Thank you so much for spending time with me today. And uh, these are the references that I used since I am a student. <laughs> and this is my contact information if you guys have any further questions for me or just wanna continue this discussion. Thank you, Sophia. This is um, thank you for reminding us about the uh, both the opportunities and the threats uh, of tools like this in an environment that creates an inequity. And let's keep on uh, thinking about inequity. So I think it's very uh, uh, potential inequities that can create it. So very very um, impressive. Um, our uh, last speaker uh, for this panel, uh, let me see, is Fian uh, Van. Dan, sorry, I'm completely uh, mispronouncing your name. I'm so sorry. Please, rely, please introduce and, and give us the uh, correct pronunciation. Um, and uh, Fian is a Dutch UWC East Africa um, alumnus and a current social science student at Minova University. And she's interested in economics as well as AI and part of the AI consensus, an initiative that aims to incorporate student perspectives in discussing uh, discussions surrounding AI in education and is supported by the Responsible Technology Youth Power Fund. And um, without further ado, I hand the floor over to Fien, uh, or Fien, and then I'll let you reintroduce yourself and apologize for mispronouncing your name. No worries. It's a very challenging name. Like, a, like you just mentioned, I'm from the Netherlands, so it's called Fien van den Hondo, but I, I don't expect people to be able to pronounce it fully. Uh, so no worries there. Okay. Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, the introduction was just said, but I am an international student. Uh, as my name tells, I am born in the Netherlands. Uh, I finished my high school in Tanzania, actually, at the United World College East Africa, and I'm currently studying in the United States. And I actually learned English about four years ago. Um, and oh boy, did I wish that ChatGPT was available at that time. Uh, because learning a new language is really not easy and I felt trapped. I really had a feeling that I could not properly express my thoughts and my ideas in English, which impeded my ability to get across my main thesis in a paper or my insights on an assignment. Um, and I'm surrounded by a lot of international students and I know that a lot of international students are struggling with this. Um, and that AI tools can help them with language barriers and can give them a more fair chance in internships or job opportunities is only one reason why schools should really not ban uh, generative AI tools. The second one being that students will need these skills to navigate uh, uh, and remain job ready. For example, in Italy for a while, they banned AI chatbots, while in Japan, they just published guidelines that emphasizes the student's comprehension of AI. So just imagine a future Italian and Japanese student applying for a job that could be done more effectively when thoroughly understanding how to use AI. As you can see, it creates an unfair comparative advantage for those who learn how to use it. And this was actually also one of the Q&A questions. So I hope that kind of answered that question there. On top of that, I don't think students should try to detect AI use of students. Why? Well, detection tools have shown to have very high false positive rates. Uh, and if you don't believe me, I just have one example here on the slide. On the left side, there are three detection tools that claim that they're either certain that the US constitution is written by AI or can't really confirm that this content is actually human generated. And moreover, some study from Stanford scholars, which I cited down below in the, in the slide, uh, actually found that many of these detection tools are biased against work of non-native English writers, which makes me as a non-native English speaker, very sad. <laughs> 
And um, also, while I hate to reveal our secrets, I as a student know that we can easily get around detection tools, even though maybe we shouldn't. Um, I've seen people around me that feed a, a chatbot's input uh, or feed it um, input that it can emulate to make the output sounds more like themselves. Or I've even seen using students different AI tools to rewrite what was written by another AI tool. Well, you get the idea. So I really believe we should not ban AI tools nor try to detect them. So then what should we do? We should teach students durable skills. And while this is far from a comprehensive list, I will give you three today that used, you could and should be applying in your classroom. The first one being critical analysis. Um, I will not forget what my psychology professor did when she found out about ChatGPT. She showed us this question, which is now uh, you can see on the slide, um, and asked us to grade the output. And after a thorough discussion in class, we unanimously believed that the grade should be a two out of four, which is very low. Not only was the answer that ChatGPT provided quite vague, it was simply fallacious. And if there are any psychology professors out there, don't worry. I now understand that natural kinds always do not exist, contrary to what this chatbot says. You see, like we've talked about it before, AI chatbots can do this thing called hallucination, something that professors will be able to detect because they're experts in the field, but students will often take for granted because they think chatbots are like search engines, while they really are not. Because search engines cannot lie with much, as much confidence as AI tools really can. Um, this specific Google Bar chatbot can, without an eye twitch or a nervous laugh, tell you that Toilet Paper Roll Olympics, a sport slowly growing in popularity, is actually an article written by Alexa Smith. And you probably imagine that this is actually not the case. So there are two takeaways from this for both students and professors. Firstly, we shouldn't solely or over rely on any AI chatbot's output without critically analyzing it. And secondly, we should really verify AI-generated information by consulting trustworthy and reputable sources. Um, so overall, ensuring that students are aware of the limitations of generative AI is key. And professors play actually a great part of this, because my just like my psychology professor did, uh, which really humbled the classroom by showing that you can also get a pretty bad grade if you just rely on AI output. And this is a tangible thing that you can do as an educator, that students, for example, grade some of ChatGPT's output uh, to create this kind of awareness. Um, and on top of that, sometimes the classroom content is specific to your way of teaching your curriculum and ensuring that students understand where and how AI outputs deviates from what is being expected and what knowledge one should have in your class should be the first thing a professor teaches in any course, really. Well, I'm both a student and a teaching assistant at my university. And I learned something from both of these perspectives, which I like to call a student confirmation bias. And it works as follows. Students choose a topic, a thesis, or a stand based on what they think will benefit them most on an assignment. And then only afterwards, they will search for the sources supporting that view. And I'm not saying that every student does this, of course, but I think we are all sometimes guilty of using these techniques and especially students if they have to write an assignment with very little time. AI chatbots make it much easier to fulfill this kind, this kind of cognitive bias because not only outline they for you perfectly the reasons for supporting this view, but also because it can write it down in a compelling way, which it makes it seem like your view is the only truth out there. Um, and therefore, we should teach students cognitive biases and heuristics that can influence their adaptation and belief in AI tools. And secondly, well, the first skill that I just talked about, the critical analysis, was about identifying is an, if an output is truthful. Bias identification as a skill looks at how you frame a question. For example, linguistic manipulation, such as loaded language or using strong emotional content, as well as using words with certain connotations to be identified and analyzed. Here on the slides, you can actually see an example of two questions framed in a different way. The first one is, given the remarkable achievements of the government policies, how well did the government deal with the San Francisco housing crisis between 2019 and 2021? And the second one says, given the government's ineffective policies that has exacerbated the San Francisco housing crisis, how well did the government deal with this crisis? And as you can see, I'm basically asking the same question, just with a preconceived notion in it. And if you can read it, I hope you can, that you can see that the answers differ drastically. Again, showing these sort of examples in your class and asking students to identify biases in your specific class can be a great way to create this sort of awareness. 
The final part of bias identification is that you as an educator should understand which biases in your specific subject domain are most prevalent. On the left here, one can see a study looking at biases in AI chatbots in the political views it holds. While on the left, you can see a photo of an article claiming that artworks created by AI tools often look way too European and are therefore not really representative. Therefore, professors really need to understand their domain-specific biases as well as other common cognitive biases, including framing questions right and teachers show students how these biases can impact their output. The third one, and the third meta skill is continuous improvement. First of all, let's get something straight. The initial version of any prompt is rarely perfect. Uh, there may be a lack of specificity, which results in ambiguity or in, cl in clarity, or in other cases, students may need to provide additional information, adjust the tone, medium, or any contextual details of the prompt to make them more effective. And part of preventing students from over relying on output is that students critically analyze the output and potential biases as we discussed before. But after these initial steps, students should iterate. They should learn how to improve their inputs to consequently get better outputs. And I will give you two examples of that today. Um, iteration to get better examples and changing the level of difficulty. For example, explain to students the concept of Jeremy Bentham's panopticon and it really may feel like them to something that doesn't concern them, or at least that was the case for me when I was taking a philosophy class and that. But asking ChatGPT to come up with relevant examples to them, it can describe to you in great detail how the current social media landscape is just like the like Panopticon, which is way more relevant to students. Uh, the second example, ask ChatGPT for an explanation of the Condorcet paradox, and it will be long and boring and complex if you show it to, for example, a 10-year-old but ask you to take into consideration the level or age of this person. And well, you can read it. It will start with, hey there, kiddo. And it will talk about ice cream flavors to, to really show this paradox. So getting to better examples and changing the level of difficulty of an output and therefore getting great examples of how one can use iteration to get better learning outcomes. So from this, we learned that use AI to enhance learning through improvement of prompts and encourage students to iterate. Nothing is perfect right away, and that is fine as long as they're encouraged to work through their prompts and therefore also really improve it. Conclusion. No banning, nor trying to detect AI tools. Instead, teach and show students how to critically analyze output, ensure that they can identify biases, and let them iterate to improve their input continuously. And also a final tip, talk to your students. Listen to what they have to say. Uh, to what their concerns are there in the classroom, to how they use it in your specific course. And I promise you that you will learn a lot more from that than from this presentation. On a final note then, I'm actually writing an academic paper on these skills and much more, such as the importance of problem definition and challenge mapping. And since the presentation had very limited time, if you're interested in more of these insights, more prompts and more tips of adopting AI in the classroom, please feel free to reach out to me. And thank you so much for listening. Wow, thank you so much, uh, Vian, uh, for reminding us about the importance of metacognition and the high-level strategies and critical analyses. So um, we have about seven minutes left, and, and I am tracking all of the specific questions and answers. Uh, uh, We're doing a great job answering them. So I'm going to use the opportunity to kind of ask a, a question that just from listening to this, and, and I just love to hear your thoughts on this. Um, you know, what we learned today in this organization as well as the PRED panel is that AI is not one tool, it's not designed to serve one function. Uh, in the context of education, AI can be used as a tool to execute something. You simply given an instruction of an assignment, generates assignment. That's what most education educators are worried about. Students are not going to do the work and they're going to let the AI do the work. But from your presentation, excellent uh, point, point that you, you all have made is that it can be used as a learning companion to guide the learning thought process. And, and it can be used as a very powerful new way of accessing knowledge out there in the, into the search and the textbook. So there are other functions or other uses of AI that is valuable in education. It's not about students automatically gonna use it as a tool to um, do your homework. But the, but the question remains, um, you guys are you know, motivated, great students and out there 
but even for myself, I mean, in, in our daily day in life, how do we resist that urge? Is there anything that the educators, your professors, your instructors can do to guide you to, to make you think that homework is not a chore that you do it and you turn it in and you get a grade, but it's an opportunity to engage in the assignment and, and engage in deep learning. In, the, in theory, all of you highlighted the importance of that kind of motivation. In practice, when you're taking 20 credits per semester and your, your finals are on the line, there is a strong urge to actually use the tool just to simply perform the essay. What can the educators do to give you that cue to, to encourage you to use AI the right way and not just simply use it to, uh, to perform the uh, homework? Love to hear your thoughts on this question. Anyone goes to me, yep. I Feel think there are um, many different kind of iterations of that question where you say like, well, how do we make sure that students are just using it for homework or like, well, we want students to be able to still learn these like critical thinking skills. And I think one of the answers is just that we have to give students the tools to be able to use it properly so that they aren't using it improperly. So for me, I think an improper use would be to say, okay, I have this prompt to write an essay. I'm simply going to put the prompt into ChatGPT and then see what the output is and then I'll submit that. That I think we can all agree is an improper use and probably plagiarism. However, like if we're using something like ChatGPT to revise an essay or to use it in the critical thinking and the learning process, I think that is a proper use. But the question is, if students don't have skills to use it properly, they aren't going to one, know how to use it properly, and two, they aren't going to be motivated to even learn how to use it properly because they don't necessarily have that motivation. And that's where I think educators have a cool opportunity to kind of teach students how do we use it by uh, by different, like giving them different prompts or by giving them uh, just different like instruction on how to even use it properly so that their first resort isn't to use it in a way of just like putting this prompt into chat GBT, but rather, oh, let me use one of these prompts that I know how to use that says, hey, Jack, chat GBT, be my tutor and show me how to revise this sentence and tell me how I can improve my grammar in the future. Um, so I think when we make the like prompts really accessible for students, they're probably just going to pick one of those up instead, rather than just resorting to write this essay for me, because that's an easy one that comes to everybody's mind. That's that's one of the first thoughts that, that comes to my mind. Excellent. Thank you. It's very thoughtful. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, go ahead, Jan. I know. I agree with Sophia's point, but I also think it's important to work backwards and ask the question of, why do students learn in the first place and what motivates them to learn? And I would like to suggest a maybe a fundamental, but nonetheless a change in the approach to education and learning and acknowledge that learning is often social and we can use that to engage students more. And perhaps it would be nice to redesign the class so that it's more active and uh, where students actually have to employ the skills or knowledge they learn during homework, because I believe that if you make the classroom uh, more interactive, they'll have a natural motivation to do their homework uh, because they'll want to contribute and they'll want to interact with other humans and show that they're actually like capable of doing stuff. So I, I just fundamentally think that homework uh, should be translated into what students do in the in the class. And from my experiences, especially in Poland, I know that it's not always the case. Yeah, excellent point. I mean, really, it forced, I mean, really recently, I think a lot of instructors and educators in this space are really thinking about what's the value and the purpose of homework to begin with and ask that fundamental question. And what's the relationship between the format of assessment that we have in relation to the learning outcome where we, we wanted to have. So I think those are great questions that you push. Um, one quick question. I mean, this is just a very, uh, to, to conclude this, and then, uh, then I have a very quick summary. Uh, maybe just one answer, anyone who jump in. That unlike an expert using an AI tool to perform a job in a, in a professional setting, a professor using AI or researcher using AI, learning is a very different context. Oftentimes the learners do not have the knowledge or background or experience to assess the quality and accuracy of this. So in this sense of, I just love to know, like, what are some of the strategies uh, for a critical thinker or a typical student that they will engage to say, okay, here's an output 
that that's from this. How do I assess the accuracy? I mean, hallucination is one problem, but hallucination can be easily taken care of just even by adding a prompt to say, don't hallucinate, only include real prop, you know, references. And oftentimes you'll get a very uh, straightforward answer from ChatGPT. But how do you train or how do you, how do you develop that kind of skills to know that it's a dialogue? It's you also giving input to get the answers you want. And how do you um, get into that? Let me say versus, let's say, someone who wants to use ChatGPT to do something for their business or generate a marketing plan, right? So, so quick thoughts on this question. Maybe uh, uh, Chinet or Fiam, any thoughts? I think part of this to make it try to make it very tangible for professors to actually use this is to always encourage your students to ask if ChatGPT gives you any sources, like references to any articles or to any sort of papers to ask it to provide the name of the source and then always source check or the name of the article or always ask it to get a link. Um, in terms of things like, um, like mathematical problems or even logic problems, one thing that really helps is asking things like ChatGPT to reason step by step. So to really take you through uh, a problem step by step and then really go like, go with the ChatGPT, like really follow every step that it makes and think by yourself, is this logical? Does this make sense? It will still provide you the answer to a certain extent, but if you ask it not to say, okay, this is the, the question that I have, just give me the answer, but also reason through it for me and ask it literally in the prompt say, reason this step-by-step step, or explain to me how this works step-by-step. Step. It will be easier for students to follow um, and to really use their own judgment and to see, okay, what, where does the reasoning go wrong if the reasoning goes wrong? So those are two different things that you can do in terms of the sources and, and I guess with the logical reasoning or more uh, practical problems that you can ask. Adding to that kind of response, um, yeah. you know, I think that there are, uh, in ChatGPT, there are a number of recent plugins that came out that actually are linked directly to uh, that helps hook up your uh, agent to a research paper. So when you ask a question, for example, uh, that potentially could result in a citation in a research paper, it would automatically perform that search for you such that the responses that it, it res responds with are actually linked directly to the research paper rather than hallucinating on the fly. In addition, there are uh, a lot of number of other uh, generative AI tools such as Bing AI chat um, that actually links directly to some of the web search results as well. Great, thank you so much. It's a humbling experience to see how uh, you know, articulate and, and how thoughtful um, your presentations are. I appreciate Jan's um, suggestion on how AI can be used in business education and very interesting case studies and, and examples. And China to your um, um, advocacy for more holistic uh, integration of AI into the entire learning experience rather than just using it in you know, a limited way. And Sophia, your a reminder about the inequity and potential digital gap and the problems that we are thinking to the more inclusive mindset. And then Vian, your um, excellent suggestions of, and tips for educators to think about in building metacognition and analytical framework into our assignments. So I really appreciate your time, too, too little time. And then we had more questions that we have time to even address and dive, uh, dive, so, so, uh, dive into. I encourage everybody to uh, uh, follow up with our excellent panelists and engage in a wider community. And then I appreciate your time and thoughts. And thank you very much for your time. I'll end the conversation here. Thank you too. Thank you for thank the you. audience. Thank you.